Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series comes from the Omohundro Institute and HelloFresh. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 162 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. What did British imperial officials in London and the representatives in North America make of the American Revolution? Although we've explored the revolution from many different viewpoints throughout the Doing History to the Revolution series, thus far, many of our diverse viewpoints have really been from the vantage point of the revolutionaries. So in this episode, we're going to change our point of view and explore the American Revolution through the eyes of an imperial official, John Murray, the fourth Earl of Dunmore, who served British imperial interests in North America before, during, and after the American Revolution. Our guide for this exploration is James Corbett David, a historian and strategic communications consultant in Washington, D.C., who wrote the book Dunmore's New World, The Extraordinary Life of a Royal Governor in Revolutionary America. As we explore the revolution from an imperial point of view, Jim reveals details about the life of John Murray, the fourth Earl of Dunmore, how imperial officials viewed the loyalties of British North Americans towards the crown and empire, and information about Dunmore's proclamation, including what led Dunmore to issue it and what impact it had on the British war effort. But first, don't forget that you can explore the American Revolution beyond episodes in our Doing History to the Revolution series. In addition to the fantastic free and interactive content that you'll find in the OI Reader app, which is available for all iOS and Android devices, the Omohundro Institute has just published a special issue of its William & Mary Quarterly with some of the latest scholarship on the American Revolution. This issue is part of a special collaborative project between the William & Mary Quarterly and the Journal of the Early Republic, because both journal editors found that, even after nearly 250 years, there's still so much more that we need to explore about the American Revolution in order for us to better understand it. The Omohundro Institute is making this special issue available to you at a listener-only discounted rate of just $10. So visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ promo to get your discounted copy. Are you ready to shift gears a bit and explore the American Revolution through British imperial eyes? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest is a strategic communications consultant in Washington, D.C. He received his Ph.D. in history from the College of William & Mary, where he focused his studies on political culture in the era of the American Revolution. He is the author of the book, Dunmore's New World, The Extraordinary Life of a Royal Governor in Revolutionary America, with Jacobites, Counterfeiters, Land Schemes, Shipwrecks, Scalping, Indian Politics, Runaway Slaves, and Two Illegal Royal Weddings. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, James Corbett David. Thanks for having me. Jim, you state that the British Empire involved a lot of different players, and that we can see many of those players through the life of John Murray, who was the fourth Earl of Dunmore, and a man who played a somewhat infamous role during the American Revolution. So would you provide us with an overview, as the title of your book describes it, of the extraordinary life of a royal governor in revolutionary America, with Jacobites, counterfeiters, land schemes, shipwrecks, scalping, Indian politics, runaway slaves, and not one, but two illegal royal weddings? Yeah. As the subtitle of the book suggests, it's a wide-ranging story and a little bit difficult to summarize, but I will do my best here. John Murray was a Scots aristocrat who spent 30 years in the House of Lords, some time in the army, but most well-known for his time as a royal official in the colonies. He was the governor of colonial New York for about a year in 1770 and 1771. Then he became the governor of Virginia, where he spent more time, a lot of it during the rebellion and later the revolution. 
And then after the war, he returned to England and was redeployed as governor of the Bahama Islands from about 1786 to 1796. So he spent roughly a decade in the Bahamas after the American Revolution. So he's a very interesting figure for a variety of reasons, one of which is just chronological. So he's someone who is a representative of empire before, during, and after the American Revolution in the American theater. And so what his career shows is not only what life was like in the colonies for political elites and other political actors before the revolution and what the loyalist experience in particular was like during the war, but also what the British were up to after the war and what their political designs were on what we now think of as sort of destined to become the United States of America. We certainly have a lot of history to discuss, but before we move into it, would you tell us how you came up with such a great title for your book? It's both really descriptive and a lot of fun. So the book was born out of my dissertation, and you probably won't be surprised to learn that this was not the subtitle of the dissertation. So I think that the subtitle of the dissertation is something like political culture in the British Empire during the American Revolution or you know something more conventional. But when speaking with the publisher, they agreed with the positioning of the book as something that might be of interest to people who had a serious interest in the history of the revolution or the history of Virginia. And so we thought we might try to get creative. And in doing so, we realized how difficult it was, as I said earlier, to summarize all of the interesting elements in the story. So we came up with the idea of having a longer subtitle that sort of was reminiscent of some of the longer titles of 18th century histories. So if you've ever done primary research, you know that there are very lengthy titles that include a lot of different things in that period. And so we were trying to be reminiscent of that while also communicating some of the diverse aspects of the story that might catch a reader's attention. Now, as Jim mentioned, John Murray, the fourth Earl of Dunmore, was a representative of empire before, during, and after the American Revolution. Yet, before he became a representative of the British Empire, he actually fought against it in the Jacobite Rising of 1745. Jim, would you tell us about the Jacobite Rising of 1745 and how it informed Dunmore's early thoughts on power, governance, and empire? Sure. The Jacobite Rebellion of 1745 was the last military expression, in any case, of a movement to restore the Stuarts to the British throne. So in 1788, the Hanoverians unseated the Stuarts through the Glorious Revolution. And ever since that time, from 1768 up to you know, through the first half of the 18th century, there were people in Britain who wanted to reverse that outcome. They weren't Catholic, but they were, I would say, traditionalists who wanted to right the wrongs of 1688 and felt that the Stuarts had been unfairly removed and that they were the rightful family to rule in Great Britain. And a lot of them were Scottish. And among the Scots who supported Bonnie Prince Charlie, who was heir to the Stuart monarchy, They supported him when he returned to Scotland in 1745 and raised an army that was quite successful in Scotland and actually ended up conquering Edinburgh without much resistance and started moving south, fought a number of battles fairly successfully, picking up new volunteers and supporters along the way. Eventually, the British army turned its full focus to putting the rebellion down and ironically, Lord Dunmore, he was roughly 15 or so at that time. His father joined the rebellion. Others in his family were supporters of the House of Hanover, including his uncle, who was then the Earl of Dunmore, was actually leading British forces in Flanders at the same time that uh, I believe the Duke of Cumberland was called back to England to put down the Jacobite Rebellion, which he did successfully. And there was a culminating battle at Culloden, which was a terrible disaster for the Jacobites. And a number of the participants there were either killed or tried for treason 
Body Prince Charlie himself uh, attempted to make his escape, but was subsequently captured. So William Murray, who was Dunmore's father and who had joined the rebellion, was also captured and convicted of treason. But there was a long process through which his brother, the Earl of Dunmore, who was a general in the British Army, attempted to secure a pardon for him. And the reason for this, in part, was because the then Earl did not have any children of his own. And so if his brother were hanged for treason, the earldom would disappear. So he needed William to remain alive in order to transfer the title to his children, including John Murray, which he did successfully manage to secure an 11th hour pardon for William Murray, who lived the rest of his life more or less under house arrest as the third Earl of Dunmore. And when he died, the earldom went to his son, John Murray, the fourth Earl. The experience of the Jacobite Rebellion must have been quite formative for John Murray. He was a teenager. He was very, very close to the action. And he saw how transitory political power could be. He was obviously involved with his father, an attempted coup, an unsuccessful one. But he must have taken some lessons from that. But mostly it became a sore point for him throughout his life. Once he was sort of welcomed back into the Hanoverian fold, it was sort of a stain on his Britishness, the fact that his father had participated in this rebellion and it had failed. So I think it must have been quite exciting and ultimately traumatic first chapter for John Murray's political life. In one of the next chapters of John Murray's political life in 1769, Dunmore became the royal governor of the colony of New York. Jim, would you tell us how Dunmore became the governor of New York? Was it simply because of the noble title he inherited? So it was actually quite unusual for someone of Dunmore's social status not to become a governor because historically there had been a lot of absentee governors who were earls and other members of the nobility, but very few of them came to America to live. So Dunmore was exceptional in that way. But He got the job through the way that a lot of people got jobs in the empire, which is through personal connections, particularly was the influence of his wife and her family that helped secure this post for Dunmore. Let me take a step back, talk about his career kind of up to that point. He had been in the army in the 1750s, hadn't really been successful or advanced very quickly. So he left in some frustration and resigned from the army before getting married. He got married to his cousin, Charlotte Murray, and her father was the Earl of Galloway, who was a very prominent person, not particularly wealthy, but certainly a good match for Dunmore. But most importantly, his brother-in-law was Lord Gower, who was the president of the Privy Council. So Dunmore's wife's sister had a very influential husband, and it was through Gower that Dunmore was able to secure the appointment as governor, not only of New York, but also as governor of Virginia, which was seen as a very significant promotion. Many historians have argued that the British North American colonists were loyal to King George III right up until sometime in 1776. And some historians have also posited that the colonists in British North America were even more British than Britons who lived in the United Kingdom. Yet, it seems that this profound colonial loyalty to the British Empire and monarch was not on display for Lord Dunmore to see. Jim, would you tell us about Dunmore's impressions of and interactions with British North Americans in both New York and Virginia? Yeah, so when Dunmore arrived in New York in 1770, he was greeted with a number of the forms of respect and deference that you would expect in a monarchical political system. He was showered with praise and people wrote letters and published petitions in the newspaper, you know, in celebration of his arrival. What he soon learned was that the form of subjecthood in the colonies was very assertive where colonist loyalties and obedience to the king 
were based really on how it could help them in pursuit of local and personal interests. So very often there was loyalty expressed to the king while at the same time voicing opposition to the king's representatives. So the colonists would, if there was tension between what the king's representatives were attempting to accomplish and their own interests, they were very quick to challenge that authority and appeal to the king and try to make their case directly to him. But when it became clear in later years as the revolution approached that the king did in fact support the actions of his officials, it wasn't a very large leap for the colonists to make to actually oppose the king himself and the system of monarchy. This is not to say that a rejection of monarchy was in any way predetermined, but it is to say that there was a high level of independence in the colonies, that the colonists viewed the empire and the monarchy as something that was supposed to protect and defend them and promote their interests. And when they discovered that that wasn't always the case, there was a sizable population in the colonies that was ready to rebel outright. So there were a lot of kind of harbingers of that outcome in Dunmore's experience. I'll give you an example. When Dunmore arrived in New York, he was entitled to half of what the lieutenant governor had made in terms of perquisites and emoluments during the period between Dunmore's appointment and his arrival. This was a precedent that had been set long before and that the ministry at Whitehall firmly supported. Dunmore had a letter from the secretary for the colonies saying that he was entitled to this money. And of course, the king himself supported this, although didn't get involved directly in a situation of this type. But the lieutenant governor, Cadwalder Colden, someone who'd been extremely influential in New York politics since the 1720s, was this polymathic intellect, a scientist, as well as a politician, immediately said no, that he wasn't going to surrender half of the money that he had made as governor during this gap period. And what ensued was a lengthy legal battle where Colden appeals directly to the king and attempts to send off Dunmore's efforts to get him to show how he had spent the money and so forth. There was a long legal process that started. So Colden was in no way in awe of royal authority. When the colonial secretary told him to do something, he had no problem saying no and challenging it very firmly. That was just on day one. Everything else in Dunmore's experience sort of showed that there was, even at lower levels of the social structure in the colonies, a lot of appetite for resistance. This raises some interesting points, and I wonder if we could talk about the extent to which the British Empire really existed in North America on the eve of the American Revolution. Because you note in your book, Dunmore's New World, that the toppling of King George III's statue in Bowling Green on July 9th, 1776 was less a radical departure from the pre-1773 order than a spectacular culmination of it. So, Jim, would you tell us why it proved to be so hard for the British government to secure the obedience and loyalty of its North American subjects? So, one of the reasons why land was so important in this political environment was that it was the primary means through which the empire had secured the consent and the cooperation of subjects. Take, for example, the French and Indian War. The colonists who participated in that conflict didn't do so out of primarily a sense of allegiance to the British Empire or hostility to the French. They needed financial inducements in order to leave their farms and daily lives and fight for the king. The empire understood this, and so Governor Dinwiddie, in the case of the French and Indian War, offered land grants to the men who served in that conflict from Virginia. But I think primarily what we can often think of in a monarchy is that there is automatic deference or automatic obedience to the royal will. And that is decidedly not the case in colonial America. And you can see that in the need to incentivize consent at pretty much every turn. 
So if there wasn't an ability to give colonists jobs, so if you were a governor and your patronage powers were limited, as Dunmore's were, and you were restricted from granting land to colonists, which Dunmore was, you really didn't have the tools at your disposal to secure the allegiance of colonists. So they were very independent-minded and expected the empire to serve them and their interests. And when their help was needed, they needed to be compensated. As Jim just described for us, land was really important in terms of securing the loyalty of colonists. It also played a really important role after the costly French and Indian War, when Great Britain attempted to accomplish three goals. The empire wanted to avoid costly Indian wars, raise revenue to pay off its war debt, and to secure the loyalty of its North American subjects. And one way the empire attempted to accomplish all three of these goals was by regulating land with the Proclamation Line of 1763. Jim, what was the Proclamation Line of 1763, and how did the British government seek to accomplish all of its goals with this proclamation? Yeah, it's a very important document in the history of British America, in part because it was so unsuccessful. But the theory behind the proclamation line, which was a boundary roughly along the Appalachian Mountains that limited white settlement to the east and preserved land to the west for various Indian nations. The problem with the outcome of the French and Indian War from the British perspective was they had won a massive amount of land. And with that land came a desire of colonists to move west and to settle there. But the empire wasn't really in a position to control the actions to set up institutions of government and put really the infrastructure in place to prevent that movement from disrupting Indian relations and causing new wars and conflicts. So the empire came out of that conflict, you know, with an enormous amount of debt and this vast new territory. And the question was how to settle that land and expand the empire west in an orderly way so that, for instance, the government could collect quit rent revenue from land grants to colonists west of the mountains rather than just have settlers move west and squat on lands and develop the lands themselves in a way that was irregular and that their behavior couldn't be restrained with respect to the Indians in particular. So it was a very complicated process. And adding to that complexity was this dynamic where land grants were critical to the acquisition of political consent. So officials like Dunmore needed land in order to secure the allegiance of colonial subjects. And the proclamation restricted their ability to do that. So what we had was a very precarious position for representatives of empire, governors who were asked to exercise royal authority without really the tools in their toolkit to do so. And the proclamation line was a major restricting factor in that dynamic. The proclamation line of 1763 really put colonial governors in a tough position. And Dunmore was one of those royal governors who witnessed the creation of this precarious position and the decline of royal authority in colonial British America. In fact, on Christmas Eve 1774, as governor of Virginia, Dunmore wrote a letter to his superiors in London that detailed the troubling independence of Virginians' minds. In this letter, Dunmore noted that the established authority of any government in America and the policy of government at home are both insufficient to restrain the Americans in their movement west, and in their defiance of British government. Yet, even as he watched what we now know as the American Revolution begin and turn into war, Dunmore chose to remain in North America. Jim, why did Dunmore choose to remain in America, and how did he respond to the American Revolution? So it's a great question because most other governors did go home at a certain point when the revolution erupted and their positions there became untenable. To understand why Dunmore stayed, you have to understand, I think, something about his personality. He was a very action-oriented person. 
very much inclined to act first and ask for forgiveness later. And well, he had two, I think, big picture goals. Number one, he wanted to secure a fortune for his family in America, and he wanted to settle on a permanent basis in America. That was very unusual for a governor of his social status to want to live in America long term. It was not unusual for people of his social status or for governors to have financial difficulties, which Dunmore did throughout his life. But he had granted himself large tracts of land, and he had purchased large tracts of land in the American interior. And so he had a vested interest in preserving British authority in the colonies. So that's one important piece of context. Another is just the fact that while he had not been successful in the military, he had a military bent and was eager for opportunities to do something of significance in a situation where the empire needed help. So he was not one to shy away from conflict, and he was very, very hopeful that he might be able to do some good in Virginia after the revolution broke out. And ultimately, that proved not to be the case. And I think there's a fair amount of room to question his judgment at a number of points along the line. But one critic of his during the war compared him to Don Quixote. And it's an apt analogy in the sense that Dunmore remained committed to the British cause in America much longer than many others did. And he was willing to risk his life in the process. So Dunmore stayed in British North America to support and defend royal authority in his land claims during the American Revolution and Revolutionary War. And one action that he took to this end was issuing his famous proclamation. Jim, before you tell us all about Dunmore's proclamation and what led him to issue it, we should take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is HelloFresh. Did you know that in 18th century North America, late fall and early winter was actually a time of plenty for many people? Not only were foods such as sugar, rum, and spices used to make special holiday gifts of food, but meat and some vegetables were also in greater supply this time of year. Of course, there was no refrigeration, so you pretty much had to eat everything right away, which may have led some early Americans to experience some seasonal weight gain. Of course, in the 21st century, we have an abundance of food all year round and refrigerators to preserve it all. Still, November and December can mean seasonal weight gain for many of us due to what sometimes can feel like a gauntlet of cookies, cakes, alcohol, and other rich foods. This is where we could all really use HelloFresh for a healthier holiday season alternative. As a happy customer, I know that HelloFresh sources the freshest ingredients, measured to exact quantities needed so that there's no food waste and no overserved portions. And I also know that HelloFresh employs two full-time registered dietitians on staff who review each recipe to ensure that it's nutritionally balanced. Plus, HelloFresh sends me all the food I need for a week in a well-insulated, fully recyclable box, which it delivers right to my front door. So no overcrowded grocery stores for me. And they do all of this for less than $10 a meal. So why not let HelloFresh help you out this holiday season with healthy meal planning and grocery shopping? For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and use promo code BFWORLD30. Jim, would you tell us about Dunmore's proclamation and what led him to issue it? The proclamation is a very important moment in the history of the revolution, in the history of slavery, and it hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves. Slavery and slave rebellion were obviously very, very powerful influences in Virginia and elsewhere in the colonies in the late 18th century. Slavery was something that Dunmore had not had experience with before coming to the colonies, but which he embraced immediately. He owned slaves himself and would continue to own slaves after the revolution as well when he was in the Bahamas. However, he sought to capitalize on fear of slave rebellion when the colonial resistance movement began to evolve into the revolution. Because in many ways, slave uprising was sort of the nuclear option of that period. And a number of British officials 
trying to use the inequalities in colonial society to their advantage by mobilizing disenfranchised groups, not just slaves, but allying with indentured servants and with Indian nations as well. So Dumbo was sort of in the vanguard of that. During the gunpowder controversy in the spring of 1774, which is after Virginia began to arm its local militias, Dunmore ordered that the gunpowder in the magazine in Williamsburg be removed and put aboard a British ship. This created an enormous amount of outrage and really escalated the conflict that was ongoing at that time. When he did that, a number of slaves came to the governor's palace and offered to help protect the palace and protect the British position in the capital. And at that time, Dunmore wasn't prepared to accept those offers, but it was clear that there was a willingness on the part of the slaves to fight for the British in exchange for freedom. So it was really slaves themselves that inspired Dunmore some months later to formalize an offer in the proclamation to slaves of patriot planters who were able to bear arms and fight for the king in exchange for their freedom. Now, it was not uncommon at all for slaves to be armed in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the British Empire, but this was a civil war, and it was certainly the first time that a British official had offered freedom to slaves on the express condition that they devote themselves to the destruction of other British subjects. So it was a very incendiary step, and it was not one that was born of humanitarian impulses, but it was one that came from a place of genuine military exigency. But it was also something that Dunmore honored and took quite seriously in terms of the offer of freedom to slaves. And it wasn't just male slaves who were able to fight in the war effort. Whole families of slaves escaped to Dunmore, and he took them all in. And after the war, honored the empire's commitment to women, children, the elderly, others who fell outside the official scope, the letter of the proclamation. You mentioned that Dunmore issued his proclamation primarily as a military tactic. Just how significant was this tactic? Did it really impact the British war effort or the trajectory of the American Revolution? So I think that the short answer to that is no. In terms of the number of slaves that were able to reach British lines who had the proximity and really the opportunity and the tremendous courage to take that risk, turned out in Virginia to be somewhere in the area of 1,500 slaves ran to Dunmore's fleet. But it did set a precedent that other British officials in the colonies followed, and there were similar proclamations made later in the war, and it did put pressure on patriots to formulate a policy of their own on black soldiers. So it was significant, obviously, in the lives of those slaves who attempted and successfully achieved freedom after the war. But there were a number of factors outside of Dunmore's control that prevented the proclamation from being an overwhelming influence on the war in Virginia. Probably the most important of these was disease. And the fleet that Dunmore was operating in during 1775-1776 experienced a terrible epidemic disease in the form of smallpox and typhoid fever that impacted all the loyalists who cast their lot with Dunmore, but particularly slaves. So there was a tremendous amount of suffering and casualties unrelated to the military conflict in the floating town, as Dunmore's fleet was called during that period. That must have made it a much less attractive and even riskier proposition for slaves to come to, to risk their lives for. So It was not decisive or particularly effective from a military perspective, but it was very important in the history of slavery 
and certainly in the lives of those who were directly affected by it. Now, in 1787, after the revolution has ended, Dunmore became the governor of the Bahamas. And from Jim's book, Dunmore's New World, it seems like as governor of the Bahamas, Dunmore couldn't quite let go of the American Revolution. In fact, his experience in the revolution seemed to inform the way that he governed that colony. Jim, what was Dunmore like as the governor of the Bahamas, and how did the American Revolution inform his governance? So the political situation in the Bahamas is very interesting after the revolution. It became a place where loyalists who had lived in South Carolina and Georgia primarily and then moved to East Florida during the latter stages of the war migrated to. After the war, the Floridas were taken over by Spain. And so those loyalists who had moved to East Florida, many of them ended up settling in the Bahamas. And so they immediately became a majority of the population in the Bahama Islands. But there was a pre-existing political establishment in the Bahamas that the British government supported or attempted to prevent from being entirely overwhelmed by the loyalist refugees. And that created a very difficult situation for not just Dunmore, but his predecessor there, who was essentially forced to leave and abandon the island as a result of loyalist pressure. So what you see in the Bahamas is a lot of political behavior that seems very closely related to some of what we saw in the mainland colonies that led to the revolution. Demands for more representative government, complaints about corruption, very aggressive forms of political resistance, even from those who had supported the king during the American Revolution. So Dunmore came into a very tense political situation and it took a very similar position to his predecessors with respect to the loyalists. So Dunmore had a very strong track record of supporting loyalists during and after the war. He was frequent letter writer to the Loyalist Claims Commission in support of claims that loyalists had made for lost property and for compensation. And he was really an active and I think committed advocate for people whose lives had been destroyed by their loyalty to the king. However, in the Bahamas, the tables were really turned where Dunmore felt that his authority was needed most to protect the existing inhabitants, including some free blacks in Nassau and elsewhere in the Bahamas, and that the loyalist planters were actually the aggressors and those that needed to be checked. So it was a very complicated, intense political situation and one that was very difficult to navigate. But Dunmore managed to remain in power there for 10 years or so, despite a tremendous amount of opposition from the loyalists in the Bahamas. Once again, we see loyalists, British subjects there, appealing to higher powers within the empire in order to advance their interests vis-a-vis representatives of the empire in a very contentious way. In addition to dealing with intense politics in the Bahamas, Dunmore also saw an opportunity while in the Bahamas to recapture territory on mainland North America for Great Britain. Jim, would you tell us about Dunmore's plans? So we tend to think of 1783 and the Treaty of Paris as a really bright historical line. And the truth is, is that the outcome of the war remained sort of up in the air, if not in theory than in practice, particularly in less settled areas where the political situation was very, very fluid. So I mentioned the Spanish in Florida, whose presence was really limited to ports And in the lower Mississippi Valley, again, the Spanish were nominally the controlling European presence, but the reality was that the Creek and Cherokee Indians and Choctaw Indians were really the most powerful political and military force in what historians refer to as the Old Southwest, what's today Alabama, Mississippi, and parts of Louisiana, as well as the kind of the panhandle of Florida. So there was an opportunity amid all of that 
fluidity for Britain to reestablish a foothold in the mainland. And Dunmore was very involved in pursuing that opportunity. This is actually a really good place for us to jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Dunmore was not successful in getting a foothold in North America, even though he saw many opportunities for Great Britain to do so. Still, in your opinion, Jim, what might have happened if Lord Dunmore had successfully been able to use the Bahamas as a staging area for a British offensive into continental North America? How would the history of the United States and continental North America have been different? Well, I'll begin by saying something about the prospects for success, because in retrospect, it may seem a quixotic for Denmark to have spent so much time and energy attempting to retake Florida and the lower Mississippi Valley. But in truth, if a few things had gone differently, the government may well have recognized Dunmore's efforts and supported them more than they did. So as it was, Dunmore was involved with you know, supporting filibusters for kind of unsanctioned military actions. But if the geopolitics had taken just a slight turn, if the British hadn't reached a compromise and an agreement with Spain over something called the Nootka Sound Crisis in 1793, then Dunmore's activities could have played right into an expanding conflict between Britain and Spain. But as it was, that conflict was resolved, and the government never formally recognized what Dunmore had been doing. Nevertheless, he sought compensation from the government for the investments that he had made in those military efforts for the rest of his life. So that's part one. Part two of your question is the counterfactual part. What would have been different about the development of North America had the British retaken Florida or some other part of the mainland? And I think that the obvious answer is that it's possible to envision part of what is now the southern United States developing more on the model of dominion like Canada. And that would have had very interesting implications for the development of slavery in those areas. So I think it's always tricky to speculate too much about how things might have been different. But I think it's possible if the British had retaken that land for the institution of slavery to have been less rigidly race-based as it became in the 19th century under the United States and more similar to Canada from a political standpoint. I know you work in your day job as a strategic communications consultant, but do you have a research project or projects that you're working on on the side? So I've actually stepped away from research and writing for the time being. I have a young family and a demanding job, so I'm not working on anything at the moment, but definitely looking forward to getting back into the archives and writing at the first opportunity. I can't tell you at this moment what the subject would be, but this period of the late 18th century and in the history of the British Empire and the early United States is fascinating, and I will undoubtedly focus my research there. Where's a good place for us to look for contact information for you and more information about your book? Well, the book itself is available online on Amazon and through the University of Virginia Press's website. I suppose the best place to contact me would be through my LinkedIn page. People can contact me that way and learn a little bit more about what I've done since publishing the book. James Corbett, David, thank you for taking us through Lord Dunmore's life and parts of the new world that the American Revolution created. Thank you. It's my pleasure. When imperial officials like Lord Dunmore looked at British North Americans and their actions, they didn't see a people who were more British than Britons in the United Kingdom or subjects who were more loyal to the empire and monarch than any other Briton. What they saw was a people who had to be incentivized to support the empire and its monarch. Dunmore and other imperial officials saw British American colonists as exercising a very assertive form of subjecthood. Their loyalties and obedience to the king and empire 
were based mostly on answers to questions of what could being loyal to the Empire and King do for my personal career, my economic ambitions, my colony, and my local community. As Jim mentioned, many colonists believe that monarchy and empire were institutions that were supposed to protect and defend them and promote their interests. Yet, when King George III ascended the throne and indicated that the empire had its own interests, and that the colonists really needed to support the empire's interests more than their own local interests, there was a big disagreement. And we can see this disagreement in the case of the Proclamation Line of 1763. Great Britain had acquired a lot of territory, at least a name from France, during the Seven Years' War. It also accumulated a great war debt. Imperial officials understood that the colonists wanted to move west, but establishing settlements in these new western territories would cost the government a lot of money. New settlements needed roads, protection, and governance. Plus, pushing west had nearly always met settler conflict with Native Americans. Conflicts that settlers always wanted the government to intervene in. So the British Empire decided that it simply couldn't afford Western expansion right after the war. Therefore, the government proclaimed that the colonists would have to limit their post-war westward expansion to east of the Appalachian Mountains. This limitation would ensure that the empire could expand in an orderly fashion when it was ready to make that investment and avoid costly Indian wars in the meantime. Many colonists balked at the empire's proclamation line and moved west anyway. They didn't understand why the needs of the empire should limit rather than expand and promote their own needs. So if you're the British Empire, how do you rein in your colonists so that you both secure their loyalty and reorient them to the fact that the empire supports colonization so that the colonies and their colonists serve the empire? This was a question that many imperial officials, including Lord Dunmore, grappled with in some form or another throughout the imperial crisis, and one they continued to grapple and experiment with after the 13 colonies turned states won their independence. What was the nature of empire and what role should colonies and colonists play in an empire? These were the bigger questions that all European empires had to grapple with at some point during the age of revolutions. You can find information about Jim, his book, Dunmore's New World, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 162. Today's episode was made possible with support from both the Omohundro Institute and HelloFresh. Let HelloFresh help you out this holiday season and beyond with healthy meal planning and grocery shopping. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and use promo code BFWORLD30. Finally, Jim told us that British North Americans tended to view empire in self-serving ways, and that only if the empire promoted their interests did they offer their obedience and loyalty. Does this idea about colonists' loyalty to the Empire surprise you? Let me know why or why not by sending your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.